It is time for another lecture. We had no lectures yesterday. We took a day off from lectures, but we're back again on this penultimate day of the ISS. And I'm looking forward to this one, partly because we've got a load of stuff sitting out here, including a jar of Vegemite, which I'm intrigued about. Um, today's speaker, first again in a series of two lectures, uh, did her degree here at Sydney and then left, went off to, to circumnavigate the globe in a very slow way. <laughs> Took a really long time. Did a PhD in Durham, up in the north of England, which is a lovely place, big sort of castly things up on the hill and so on. It's a beautiful university. Uh, just a bit north of where I live in, in York, actually. And then um, went and did a postdoc over at Berkeley, at University of California, Berkeley, which again is a lovely place, I believe. It's a good part of the world. So has been working her way around really lovely parts of the world before eventually coming all the way around back here to Sydney and setting up her own lab and her own research group working here in the School of Chemistry at the University of Sydney. The new lab, which I think is a great name, um, would you please make very, very welcome for today's first lecture on fluorescence and fluorescent sensors, <laughs> Professor Elizabeth New. Um, how exciting to get to talk to a room full of students. We've had a few years of COVID and students at university have stopped coming to lectures. So it is very nice to have a room full here. Um, I'm talking about fluorescent things. And so there will be a bit of juggling of the lights. There will be some time when the room will be completely dark just so that I can make sure that you can see everything. Um, let's see how we go. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today and tomorrow is about fluorescence and how fluorescence is really useful in understanding health and disease. And so we'll talk today a bit more about fluorescence, the meaning of fluorescence and what different types of fluorescence there is in just around us in the world. And then tomorrow we're going to talk about diseases, particularly diseases related to metals and how metals interact with our body. Um, and then we'll talk about how we can use fluorescent sensors to study them. So before I start, um, maybe can some of you tell me, when, when you hear the word fluorescence, what sort of things do you think of? Yes? Jellyfish? Yep. Minerals? Minerals. What else? Sorry? Glowing. Glowing? Yeah. What other things? What are thing, common things that we, we use every day that have the word fluorescence in them? Light bulbs? Yep. Sorry. I can't hear that very well, but let's continue. So these are some things that I thought of. So like fluoro shirts, fluorescent highlighters, fluorescent lights, as we've already heard, and then glow-in-the-dark stars. These are things that we see all around us. Um, we're going to talk about the scientific definition of fluorescence. We're going to understand how we can understand the process of fluorescence and then apply it to many other different processes which all involve light. Um, a bit of a history of fluorescence. In 1845, um, Frederick Herschel first discovered that if he shone ultraviolet light on quinine solution, which is just tonic water, this is called Indian tonic water, but it is just basically soda water that contains quinine, he would see blue light. And so I thought I'd demonstrate that for you first. Um, so here I've got a UV lamp. So this is a lamp that gives off ultraviolet light. And I have some quinine tonic water. And you can see here, this is the fluorescence. So this was one of the first observations of fluorescence um, by Herschel. And then only a few years later, Stokes described the phenomenon of fluorescence of taking one wavelength of light. So this is ultraviolet light, which we can't really see. Well, it sort of looks a bit purple. And it turns it into a blue color. And that's what we now understand as the definition of fluorescence. We now define it as light, luminescence, caused by the absorption of radiation of one colour or wavelength, followed by giving out light of another colour. So normally to see fluorescence, we need to shine light onto something. We normally use ultraviolet light. We're going to see a few examples of, fluores of luminescent type processes where we're not actually using light as an input. So just a quick recap on light. Remember that the electromagnetic spectrum or the electromagnetic radiation goes from very, very long wavelength radiation like radio waves 
down to very, very short wavelength radiation like X-rays. And visible light, which is what we tend to think of as light, is in the very middle, and it's only a very, very small section of this. Um, and so within the visible segment, we obviously have our red light, which is the longest wavelength, and we have our blue light, which, or ultraviolet light, which is the shortest wavelength. And energy varies dis um, inversely. So high energy radiation is down this, the right-hand end where we have short wavelengths, and low energy radiation is up this end when we have long wavelengths. So we're going to talk, there is fluorescence in everyday items. I've already shown you fluorescence in tonic water. Um, and I thought I'd show you fluorescence in a few other things. Um, we have, I don't have a white shirt on. Does, can, some, can you come up for a second? With your, yes, with your white shirt. And we can demonstrate the fluorescence in, ah, oh, thank you. What's your name? Can you... Anastasia. Anastasia, okay. So let's shine our ultraviolet light on Anastasia, and you can see the fluorescence of her shirt. Can I get my blazer? The buttons on my blazer also glow on the UV light. Yes, please do. Can I get my UV light out? Yes. <laughs> um, and while we're at it, I've got some laundry, um, laundry liquid here. So let's pour this into a beaker and look at laundry liquid. Yeah, you can come back up. Okay, beautiful PLC blazer. The buttons glow. Oh, wow. Glowing buttons and a glowing name tag. Yes. Oh, yes, very cool. Um, okay, thank you, Anastasia, very much. <laughs> so the reason, of course, that um, uh, your white clothes glow is because laundry powder is very fluorescent. Um, and so this, sorry, this is just laundry liquid, beautiful fluorescence. So the reason for that is because when we wash clothes lots of times, they'll tend to look yellow over time as they get dirty. If they fluoresce blue, then under light, there will be a little bit of blue fluorescence and that blue fluorescence will counteract the yellow and it will appear brighter. So that's why they're called fluorescence brighteners that are put into laundry liquid and laundry powder but they're also put into paper for the same reason, to make paper fluoresce. And so here you can see the fluorescence of this paper. And just for reference, I bought some filter paper. Now, obviously, when we do things in the lab, we can't have any chemicals in our paper. So filter paper doesn't contain fluorescent brightness, and you can see it doesn't glow. Um, and so there's an interesting story. The reason I have this thing about Hitler, <laughs> Hitler up here is that in the 1970s, someone found a set of diaries and claimed that they had been Hitler's diaries that he'd written when he was in the bunker just before he um, committed suicide. And they were quite controversial. They said things like, you know, Hitler never wanted to have a war, never wanted to kill any, anyone. So people got quite suspicious that maybe these were a fake. Um, and what they did is they took a sample of the paper, looked at it under UV light, and saw that it fluoresced. And they then extracted the compound that um, was causing the fluorescence, and it was a compound that hadn't been invented in the 1940s. People, fluorescent brightness were not put in paper in the 1940s. And so it became very clear that this was a hoax and it was all exposed as a fake, but not before it had been published by a huge magazine in Germany. Um, and the final example, uh, I don't have fluorescent highlighters for you, but fluorescent highlighters are fluorescent. Interestingly, blue fluorescent highlighters are not fluorescent. So that is a challenge for you in the future to invent a blue fluorescent highlighter that actually fluoresces. Um, but the last thing I have for you is some spinach. So this is frozen spinach because it dissolves more easily. This is the only lab chemical that I brought down was ethanol. Um, so I'll put safety glasses on. Not because um, we could just use methylated spirits or anything, but ethanol was more readily available. Um, so we'll put a tiny bit, and the trouble is I took this spinach out of the freezer just then, and it is frozen solid. So I'll take out a tiny bit of spinach if I can put it in a beaker. You can do this with um, any, you can do it with celery. It just works better if you've dissolved it up. Um, but you can just shine your lamp, your UV light onto celery leaves and they fluoresce beautifully as well. Okay, so we're just dissolving this up here. Hopefully it will dissolve quickly enough. Otherwise I've prepared a sample earlier. 
Um, now, to see this well, I'm going to put this on the document projector. Hopefully. Okay. Here's one I prepared earlier. Let's look at this one. Oh, okay, I'm holding it up. Can we see? What colour is it fluorescing? Yes, that's right. So this is a green solution. When we dissolve spinach in ethanol, it's obviously green by eye. And yet when we shine ultraviolet light on it, it is fluorescing red or orange. So that's a perfect example of where we're using light of one wavelength and then it's being emitted as another wavelength. Okay, so that's some fluorescence in everyday life. So now we're going to talk about the basic processes of fluorescence. So in fluorescence, we take a molecule, we shine light on it, and we give energy to that molecule. And it now becomes what we call an excited state molecule. Molecules don't like being in the excited state, and so they will go back to the ground state, but they had extra energy, and the extra energy they absorbed, they will be emitting as light. And that is the fluorescence light. We can also think of this in terms of the... Um, what the electrons are doing. So we have an electron, and it, can, it sits in the lowest energy level that it can, and we can think of that like having our bottle on the table here. If I lift my bottle and let it go, what's going to happen to it? It'll fall. I've given an extra gravitational potential energy in right, lifting it, right? It has more energy up here. Where is the energy going to go? Sound, that's right. So I drop my bottle, and it's releasing that energy as sound. So the electron does exactly the same thing. We raise it up to a higher energy level. We let it go back down again. But it gives out its energy in the form of light. And that is fluorescence. The color that emits is emitted depends on how far the electron has to fall. So remember we said that the longer wavelength lights had, um, sorry, longer wavelength lights like red have a shorter energy gap, have a lower energy um, Shorter wavelength light, like blue, have a longer, energy, bigger energy gap. And so how far that electron has to fall will tell us what the color is that comes out. We can also understand this process using a thing called a Jablonski diagram. So this is basically where we draw out the energy levels. And so we have the, when the electron has its lowest amount of energy, that's called the ground state. When it has a higher amount of energy, that's called an excited state, and the lowest excited state is S1. But we don't just have one excited state. There are lots of different vibrational energy states within this excited state. So basically, we lift our electron up, but then it can also vibrate in different ways. So if we give energy to our electron, that's a process called absorption, it doesn't go to the lowest S1. It actually goes to a vibrationally excited state. Then it gives out energy falls back down to the S1 state, that's called non-radiative decay. It's not giving out light. It's just giving out you know, heat or vibrations itself. And then it falls down to the ground state and gives out fluorescence. And the reason I'm showing you this is because you'll see that the distance the electron traveled in absorption is different from the distance it traveled in emission, in fluorescence. And that's why the fluorescence light, the light that comes out, is of a different wavelength than the light that went in. And that's why, in general, we have to excite things with an ultraviolet lamp, because that has the highest energy. It can excite things across this big energy gap. Then they fall down, and they give out less energy. So in the case of our chlorophyll in our spinach, we had green absorption, and we had red emission. In the case of the white, um, Anastasia's white shirt, we had ultraviolet absorption, and then blue emission. So let's just look then at what's happening to the electron. Our electron goes up to the excited state, falls back down, uh, gives, um, vibrationally relaxes first, and then it emits light of a different color. So we're going to have a look at a few different types of fluorescence processes. They're not all strictly fluorescence. The general term for this whole field is luminescence, that is, anything that gives out light. Um, and we're going to think about where, what the form of energy is going in and what the form of energy is coming out. So with all of these molecules that I've shown you till now are regular fluorescent molecules where the energy that we put in is light energy and the energy that we get out is fluorescence. 
And there are different chemical structures that cause that fluorescence. So this is the molecule, umbiliferone, which um, is used in laundry brighteners and in paper, fluorescent brighteners. This is the molecule quinine, which is used in, which is the um, natural product in tonic water. And the fluorescence of uh, spinach is because of chlorophyll. As you'll see, most of these molecules have lots of alternating double and single bonds. Um, these are called conjugated molecules, and we'll talk a little bit about, more about conjugation and the importance of conjugation tomorrow. So light-emitting diodes are not strictly called fluorescents, but they operate by exactly the same principle. But in the case of an LED, what is the energy input? Electricity, that's right. So now we're putting electrical energy in, but then we're doing exactly the same thing. We're exciting electrons to an excited state, and then they're falling back to the ground state and giving out light. And the distance that they fall dictates the color of the LED. OK, glow-in-the-dark stars. Now, this is a case where, so normally, if I um, shine light on my tonic or on my laundry powder, you'll see, here's the light. Now I turn it off. The second or the nanosecond that I turn it off, the fluorescence disappears. In the case of glow-in-the-dark stars, that light, remember, you turn your light off and you get glowing for hours afterwards. And that is because the process of relaxation of the um, electron falling back down is much slower. And this, is a, um, this is, class of luminescence is called phosphorescence. So it's different from fluorescence. And the reason for that is we still have light as our input, but now the electron's falling down. It's a very slow process. So we're going to have a look at what the, the science behind this is. Um, and it has to do with the electron and which way the electron is, is sitting. So in our Jablonski diagram before, we looked at a ground state and a singlet excited state. And the meaning of a singlet excited state is that the electron is in the same orientation that it was in before. So it went up to the excited state and it's still pointing down. In the triplet excited state, it flips over, so now it's pointing up. We then, if we want to see fluorescence from the triplet state, we're relying on it flipping over again as it falls down. And that is actually, it's called a forbidden transition. It can still happen, but it's technically by quantum mechanics forbidden. And so therefore it has less probability of occurring and therefore it's much slower. So now we can look, we put our electron up. This is the singlet excited state where the electron's just gone up and stayed in the same orientation. But now, if it crosses over to the triplet excited state, it's swapped over. So now you can see it's, it's parallel to our ground state electron. And so if we want to see phosphorescence, we're going to see that from the triplet excited state. Um, but it will require the electron to flip back over again as it falls down. So this is the reason that we get phosphorescence, that we're putting our molecules into this triplet form, which is in some ways more stable. It, the, the electron doesn't want to fall back down as much as it did from this state, and therefore it will stay there for longer. In general, molecules that are phosphorescent are metal-containing molecules. Okay, another example, um, we didn't talk about glow sticks, but glow sticks are what we often think of in terms of fluorescence. But what is the energy that goes into these? Well, you don't have to shine light on a glow stick, do you? Ah, uh, yeah? Chemical, that's right in the name, chemical luminescence. So the energy, the energy that's going in here is chemical energy. And the way this works is that we have, when you break a glow stick, you start a chemical reaction. And that chemical reaction is a specific chemical reaction that actually produces the molecule in its excited state. It produces the product in an electronically excited state, and then it will fall back down to the ground state. In fact, most glow sticks use exactly the same reaction. It's a reaction that produces ultraviolet light, and then they have other fluorescent molecules in them that give out the other colors. So the ultraviolet light from the chemical reaction will then excite the next reaction, which will give out whatever color you want to see. Bioluminescence. Hands up if you've seen a, a glowworm or a firefly. Oh, lots of lucky people. I think the last time I gave this talk, I had not seen one, and now I have. I went to New Zealand and saw um, some glowworms, which was pretty cool. So here, does anyone have an idea of what the energy is? Sorry? Chemical. It's chemical. That's right. It's chemical energy 
but the chemical reaction was done by the biological system. So in the case of a glow worm and a firefly, um, the, there is a molecule, this is just a small molecule, it's a chemical called luciferin, and there's a protein called luciferase. And so in the glow worm, the luciferin molecule fits into the luciferase protein, then that causes a reaction to produce a molecule called oxylu oxyluciferin, and oxyluciferin is produced in its excited state, and therefore it will give out light. This only happens, obviously, when there is ATP around, when the animal is living. Um, so this can be very useful. We can take the luciferase protein and put it into other animals and then use that as a readout for light, um, a readout for life or a readout for the presence of ATP, or we can feed it some form of luciferin which will be responsive to its environment. Okay, so there are, uh, that's a bit of an overview of the different ways we can think of producing an excited state molecule that will give out light. I'm going to talk a bit now about fluorescence in nature. Now, I've shown you this molecule already because umbiliferone was the molecule that is in our laundry brighteners, but it's also a molecule that is found on the surface of scorpions, which causes them to be fluorescent. So there are some scientists who go and hang out in forests with ultraviolet lamps and look at what everything is that's fluorescent, um, and they've made a lot of discoveries of new um, insects and plants and um, that are fluorescent. We don't quite know why that is. Maybe it helps them blend in in the bright sunlight um, if, if they're on a flower that's really bright and then the fluorescence that comes off them. Maybe it's for signaling. No one really knows yet why things like scorpions are fluorescent. We also see fluorescence in uh, some products like riboflavin. This is a naturally occurring um, vitamin but we obviously also take it in pill form and we also get it in Vegemite. So we'll have a bit of a look at the fluorescence of riboflavin. If this is a bit, maybe a bit harder to see because it's so concentrated and sometimes if there's too much light, it will quench itself. It will, um, it will um, like the fluorescence that comes out sort of um, reacts with each other and you don't, you don't see the fluorescence anymore. Now I have to spread it out really, really thinly on filter paper because if I put it onto regular paper, you'll see the fluorescence of the paper. So let's see if this works. I will try it on the document projector. Well, I can see it, but <laughs> I'm not sure that you are all able to. Uh, let me hold it up. Can anyone see some fluorescence in this? What colour is it? Yeah, it's a yellowy orange fluorescence here. Um, so that is the riboflavin in Vegemite that is fluorescing. We also have fluorescence in turmeric. Um, that this is the molecule that causes it. Again, you can see. Lots of alternating double and single bonds in this molecule. And the fluorescence of tonic water actually comes from quinine, which comes from a bark. And so this is the molecule quinine. Again, lots of alternating single and double bonds. Um, this was used for a long time as a, um, as a natural medicine. Um, and in fact, when the British colonised India and decided to bring with them or to drink tonic water, they, they thought that it was a natural anti-malarial, which is interesting because chloroquine, which was one of the first anti-malarials, is a very similarly related um, molecule. And then um, we already had someone um, tell us about the fluorescence of jellyfish. Um, and this is a very important story. So indeed, there are jellyfish that are fluorescent. And one of the molecules that is responsible for the fluorescence of jellyfish is the green fluorescent protein. This is the structure of the protein. It's a very small molecule. Um, and it just has in its very core these, um, these small molecules that are attached to the protein. And when they're brought together, they become a, fluor a fluorescent. The reason this is a really important story is because it's really transformed everything we know about um, medical research and biological research. So we can take the green fluorescent protein and put it into other animals. 
We can change the color of the green fluorescent protein so it fluoresces in other colors, and so now you can have fish that fluoresce in all sorts of different colors. This is purely for interest, but it is also a really important research tool. And because it is such an important research tool, um, it was the subject of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2008. Um, and a nice story of the progression of science, because um, Shimomura was the one who first discovered the green fluorescent protein in uh, jellyfish and worked out how to extract it. Chalfi was the one who worked out that you could um, clone it and put it into different organisms. And Roger Chen was the one who worked out that you could take, modify the structure and make different colors. Um, and so really building on this technology now, countless people around the world are using green fluorescent protein or its variants for their studies. So for example, here is a tiny microscopic worm called, called a C. elegans or a nematode. It's a really important research tool because it only has about a thousand cells and we understand very well what the role of each cell is. So for example, if we want to study the nervous system, we know that there are 200 cells and we know exactly what each cell does. The other reason it's a really important model is that it doesn't live very long. And so if we want to do studies on what is affecting aging, what makes things live longer or live less time, we don't have to wait so long to get our answers. So it's a very commonly used research tool. So what we can do with green fluorescent protein is to put the green fluorescent protein only into certain cells in the worm, and that lets us really clearly see where those cells are and how they're acting. So for example, here we've got a green fluorescent protein where all the nerve cells have been stained. Here, we, oops, here we've got one where all of the body wall muscle cells are stained. This is one where we are only looking at one particular type of nerve cell. Um, and then of course we can use lots of stains of different colors at the same time. So here we've got, the, in red is a protein involved in fat metabolism. So these are all the fat cells. And then this is looking at all of the DNA in the, in the body. And so we can start to look at and understand the interactions of those cells. Now, obviously, we can't put a green fluorescent protein into a person because this requires us to insert the gene before, before birth, well, at, at conception. But one interesting thing that has been done is that a red fluorescent cat has been developed. So these are two cats under green light. So we're shining green light on the cats. So this cat is just a normal cat that looks green because it has green light shone on it. This cat looks red because it's got the red fluorescent protein and it is therefore fluorescing red. You, the fur tends to block out the light and so that's why we see more fluorescence from the bits that don't have fur on them. And the reason this was important is because this gene for the red fluorescent protein was inserted into the embryo using a particular viral transfer mechanism and what this allowed the scientists to do was to demonstrate that they could insert a new gene into the embryo. And this may be important in the future with far more work and far more ethics considerations in, for example, correcting a protein that's defective. Because if you could insert the correct protein through a gene, then you would know that, um, then you could correct its function. And the reason that red fluorescent protein is useful is because it tells us it worked. We know that this only works if we've successfully inserted the gene. So these were fluorophores that are naturally occurring in nature. Now I'm going to talk to you about molecules that give out fluorescence, which are called fluorophores, which we make. We make them in the lab. Now this was the first synthetic fluorophore made in 1871 by von Bayer. You can see again, just like everything else we've talked about, we've got alternating double and single bonds all through the molecule. And that is partly responsible for the fluorescence of this molecule. Fluorescein is a really, really important molecule. It's used in biological studies, it's used, which we'll see uh, in, in a little bit and we'll see tomorrow. Um, it's also used in, in clothing, in the dye industry. For a very long time, it was used to dye the river in Chicago green for St. Patrick's Day. Um, so not only was it green, but it was also fluorescent. It is now not used and some more natural green dyes are used, um, but it, there was nothing wrong with it. It's not, it's not toxic. But another, oh, sorry, another really interesting study was done in 1877. This is why I think it was interesting, right? Fluorescein had only been made for the first time in 1873. Four years later, they made 10 kilograms of fluorescein, and they used it for this really important geographical study, which was that the Rhine and the Danube are the two most important rivers in Europe. And you can see that if you want to get something from one end of Europe to the other, 
You could start up here near the UK. You could end up here, down here in Turkey. If only you could transport things through both the Rhine and the Danube. And so they wanted to know whether there were underground waterways connecting the two, which potentially they could then mine and um, dig up and turn into a canal connecting the two rivers. So in order to do this, they put a whole lot of fluorescein into the water in the Rhine. And then they looked a few days later to see whether they could measure the fluorescence in the Danube. And they could. And so they were able to prove that there are underground streams between the two, and that could help them build this canal. This um, illustrates one of the real values of, the, of um, fluorescence over just molecules that give out color. And that's because fluorescence is much, much more sensitive. You can see about a million times lower concentration of fluorescence than you can of a colored molecule. Um, and when we use instruments to measure fluorescence, we get even greater sensitivity. But of course, it's also in important because if we put a green molecule into the, or a green dye into the Rhine and tried to measure it in the Danube, there are lots of green things, but there aren't many green fluorescent things, particularly not in 1877 when we, they didn't have a whole lot of fluorescent um, consumer products. So I'm going to talk now about um, how we can use fluorescence to better understand biology. Um, I'll start this today and then I'll talk a lot more about it tomorrow. So the reason this is important is because biological systems are really complicated. If we think about the cell that exists in, in us or in any animal, we think we see pictures like this in textbooks of just a ball of water, a bag of water containing organelles here and there. Sorry, I didn't know this was animated. Um, but in fact, a cell is much more complicated than this. It contains a whole lot of molecules, small molecules, large molecules, um, all throughout, there's basically no room in a cell. The cell is just full of molecules. So this becomes a problem if we want to understand where a drug molecule goes, if we want to see where a toxic molecule goes, if we want to discover a new molecule in a cell and see what it does. Sorry. Let me just get... So this is a really complicated picture when we just look at it like this. What we can do is turn off the light and just mark certain parts of the molecule that we're interested in with fluorescence. And this really makes a much simpler picture, which we now can understand. We now can look and say, that's the nucleus, they're the mitochondria, that's the cell membrane, not worrying about everything else. We do this through a process called fluorescence microscopy. So when you look under a regular microscope, you're just seeing everything. But under a fluorescence microscope, you only see the things that fluoresce. And in general, there's not too much in a cell that naturally fluoresces, so we just put in the molecules to mark whatever part of the cell we want. So I, this is sort of analogous to a where's Wally. I'm sure lots of you have already found Wally, but it took you some time to look and see where he was. And of course, a cell is much, much more complicated than this. So imagine if we could just give Wally a torch, turn off the lights, and tell him to turn on the torch. That's what we're doing in a cell. We're basically lighting up the bits of the cell that we want to study so that we can understand what's going on. So we can do this in a number of ways. So number one, we want to know how a drug is interacting with the body, where it is going. This is cisplatin. We'll talk about this again tomorrow. It's used in over half of all chemotherapies in Australia. We don't understand which cells it goes to in the body or where it goes in cells. So we, can, we want to know, understand this better we can put a fluorescent molecule on it and then watch where it goes in the body. Another thing that we can do is actually use fluorescence to mark different parts of the body. So fluorescence is used for imaging blood vessels in the eye. This is fluorescein, the molecule I showed you before. Um, this is called fluorescein angiography, where they're looking at the blood vessels in the eye. If you have like a hemorrhage in the eye, or some lack of, um, or some loss of function. It, it's often because the blood vessels stop working well. And so we can, if we put fluorescein in, it will go through the blood vessels and then it will stain where they are. And so here you can see this is a healthy eye and this is an eye where we've got this hemorrhage. Another place where fluorescence is used is, in, is starting to be used, it's a very exciting new area, is fluorescence guided surgery. So this is um, a surgeon's view of a tumor that they're trying to cut out of a patient. I think this is like in the, um, in the colon. So this is sort of what the inside of your large intestines look like. They need to see where the tumor is. 
it's impossible to tell the difference between healthy tissue and tumorous tissue. Um, and so in general, they either cut out too much and cause damage, or they cut out too little and don't cut out the cancer, and then it will spread. But this is what happens when we use a fluorescent molecule that only goes to the cancerous cells. So this is becoming common in surgery, where they will just have a, a lamp over, um, overhead, shining light to see where the fluorescence is, and now they can really clearly see where the cancerous tissue is, and they can cut out that tissue. Um, and so this is what it looks like. Here is the, it, it's like a big microscope that's um, highlighting where the tissue is. And now they do it remotely, so there's people in other countries who will be operating a robot looking under a fluorescence lamp to see where the, uh, the um, tumorous tissue is. Of course, we want to understand lots of things about biology. We don't just want to find out where Wally is, but there are lots of other interesting people in this picture that we never pay attention to, because that's not the point of the book. But if we want to study biological systems, we need to study many different interactions, many different things that are going on at the same time. And so that's where fluorescent sensors become important. So a fluorescent sensor tells us not just about the structure, so that example of where we put fluorescein into the blood vessels in the eye, we were just looking at the structure of the blood vessels. Now we want to study the chemistry of the biological system. So fluorescent sensors give us information about chemistry. So here we have our molecule that's fluorescent, we have a group that gives us information about its environment, and so whenever we, when it interacts with whatever it is that we want to study, we get a change in the fluorescence, and that tells us about the chemistry of the body. So I'm going to give you a demonstration of a very simple fluorescent sensor, and that is tonic water. So I've got my tonic water here. And we saw before that it's fluorescent. Now I'm going to put into the tonic water some salt. This is regular salt. Kept it in the container so you trust me that it's not some fancy chemical. And it's fizzing up just because it's nucleating the carbon dioxide and causing the bubbles. But that's not the point. That's not a chemical reaction. So now I shine my light on it and we don't see any fluorescence. Just to show you, here was our tonic water originally. So what, that's, what that means is that quinine, the quinine in tonic water, is a sensor of salt. We can think of it as a fluorescent sensor of salt. In fact, it's a fluorescent sensor of any salt, not just NaCl. But we could use it, for example, if I gave you two containers, one containing water and one containing salt water, and I said, work out which one is which. Obviously, you could taste it, but imagine you couldn't taste it. You could put tonic water in, look at the fluorescence, and say, this one is still fluorescent, so it is the fresh water. So that's a really simple example of a sensor. But this is work that we do a lot of, is making new types of sensors that can give us information about their environment. And so that's what we're going to talk about tomorrow. One thing that we do in our lab is make fluorescent sensors to understand metals. And so I thought tomorrow I'll tell you a bit about some fascinating interactions of transition metals with our bodies. Um, metals that cause toxicity, metals that are used in therapy, and metals that are essential for life, and then how we can make fluorescent sensors so that we can study them better. Um, but happy to answer any questions now about this lecture.